Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, keeping it free, .blogspot.com, where we've had more than 100,000 viewers. Look us up in the sports section on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, as some of you know, here online on YouTube in my Esquire 777 account, I sometimes comment on famous criminal investigations. Right? I give my thoughts on the guilt or innocence of people like Amanda Knox, right? Um, Oscar Pistorius, the situation in the Annie Dewani murder, right? I like to give my point of view. I like to discuss the evidence, especially when the case is hotly debated in their many points of view, right? Let's do so right now on a boxer, and I'm putting this on my boxing website, because many of the fight fans here online may recall the case of Reuben Hurricane Carter. Now, before I paint the picture, let's talk about my own biases and my own background. I understand I'm an attorney here in Northern California. I've been part of a judicial travesty where I represented a client and I thought because I was a minority and my client was a minority that the judge was making rulings against us that he would not have made against us if we were white right so after getting some mind-blowingly bad rulings that I knew were unsupported by the record I filed an appeal and I won in the California appellate courts Right Then, of course, the case went our way. The other party, knowing that she didn't have a case, had to step down, had to back away from the litigation. So I'm not one who believes that judicial travesties don't happen, that judges don't make terrible rulings. Let me also say, too, I personally have been wrongfully stopped by police in my vehicle several times right for me the idea of being stopped for driving while black isn't a concept it's a series of experiences I've had I know there are many older black men who remember America before BET right now who are nodding their heads watching this video let me also say too, I remember one time I was leaning on a car that I used to own. And I can tell you that a cop decided to stop by me leaning on my vehicle and asked me to show him my car keys. He didn't believe I owned the car and wanted to know what I was doing leaning on it. Right? I consider that to be profiling of the worst type. I've been a victim of that kind of profiling. So I want to be clear here before I start. I believe race matters. I'm not one of those people who believes that racism doesn't exist in America. Right? Now that said, I also don't believe in the unluckiest man in the world theory. You know what I'm talking about if you've ever watched a crime show or heard of a crime in which someone's murdered. And wow, here's a shock. The person who police suspect might be the killer just happens to have cut his hand that night with a knife just happens to have the same shoe size as the bloody footprints by the murder scene or just happens in a day in which his phone was on for 24 hours just happens to have had 
his cell phone signals ping off the tower right by the murder scene. There comes a time when you're hearing about these murder cases where you realize that the accused is not just the unluckiest man in the world, but the accused is actually the perpetrator. Now let's talk about this Reuben Hurricane Carter case. Understand too, I was a young boy in the 1970s when we talked about this case at length. Right, This case involves a lot of witnesses recanting their testimony, witnesses admitting that they gave perjured testimony, and a lot of differing versions. Right, In the 1970s, it was outrageous. I was a little boy, didn't quite understand the world, I'm not sure if I do now, but I didn't quite understand the world as well as I do now then, and I just couldn't understand how something like this could go on. But now I'm an adult, and with all due respect to the movie, with all due respect to the folklore, with all due respect to the many people, Ali, Bob Dylan, who supported Reuben Hurricane Carter, who's no longer with us, he recently passed. Let me just say this, in looking through the facts of this case, I believe it's straightforward. I believe Reuben Carter committed these crimes. Now let me back away for a second and let me just say this, right? What you need to do is to remove what I consider to be the questionable part of the evidence from your consideration, right? All I'm going to do here is focus on facts that I believe are clear-cut, right? Not later witness recanting and things like that. What I'm going to focus on is what the witnesses told the police right when the crime happened, as chaotic as that was, and the evidence that was found right when the crime happened. And from that, we're going to then ask ourselves whether the idea of a conspiracy is even feasible and whether all of these coincidences could come together in any scenario other than Reuben Hurricane Carter having been involved in the murders. Now let's talk about it. Right, the incident takes place on June the 17th, 1966 at 2.30 a.m. Right? Two men walk into a bar and shoot it up. Right now, here's what I believe you need to know. There's a witness who lives right above the bar. Her name is Patty Valentine. Right? She sees a white car with butterfly taillights and out-of-state plates. Keep in mind, this takes place in New Jersey. The plates have a blue background, right? Not Jersey plates. They're plates with a blue background. She sees this car speeding away from the scene of the crime. Right? The butterfly taillights, they're rear. White car. Out of state blue license plates. Now it just so happens that that's exactly the kind of car that Reuben Hurricane Carter was driving that night. Right? In fact, on Carter's car, a white Dodge with butterfly taillights on Carter's car were New York plates, blue plates. Now understand, if any of this 
then line up. Right, and we're in the top half of the first inning. If Ruben Hurricane Carter is driving any car other than a white car that night, then he's not a suspect in the case, right? He certainly wouldn't be a strong suspect in the case. If Ruben Hurricane Carter is driving a white car, but the white car doesn't have butterfly taillights, he wouldn't be a strong suspect in the case, certainly not as strong a suspect. If Reuben Hurricane Carter's driving a white car with butterfly taillights, but it didn't have out-of-state plates on it, he wouldn't be as strong a suspect. Unfortunately for him, if you believe his defense, he's the unluckiest man in the world. Because, of course, he's driving a white Dodge with butterfly taillights and with out-of-state plates with a blue background. Everything that Patty Valentine told the police literally minutes after the crime takes place. <clears throat> right? She calls the cops right after the crime takes place. When they come, she gives this description of the car as it's leaving. What you should know is that later that night, Valentine was shown Reuben Hurricane Carter's actual car. And, of course, she identified that as the car she saw. Understand, even if Reuben Hurricane Carter was driving a white car with butterfly taillights, out-of-state plates with a blue background, if his car was smashed in the front, if his car had distinguishing marks on it that would make the car different than the car involved in the multiple murders, then he wouldn't have been as strong a suspect as he was. Of course, his car, right, literally fit Patty Valentine's description. Now let's talk about Al Bello. He's one of history's more tortured witnesses. Now Al Bello is a mess. Make no mistake about it. He did recant his testimony later. His testimony did change later. He's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why Hurricane Carter got a retry. All of that is true. But let's talk about what Al Bello told police five minutes after the shooting. Right? Within five minutes of the shooting, Al Bello told police that the guys who committed the murder, two black men, hopped in a white vehicle with butterfly taillights and out-of-state plates with a blue background. Right? Within five minutes of the murder, right, the police arrive on the scene. They're talking to Al Bello. They get the same description of the getaway car as was given to them by Patricia Valentine. Right? Now, understand, there is no evidence that he even spoke with Patricia Valentine before giving this description to the police. So apart from anything Al Bello does later, you have multiple witnesses. You have two witnesses who describe a car that matches Reuben Hurricane Carter's car the one he was driving that night. Now let's talk about a third witness, Ronald Ruggiero. Right now, let me just say, this witness is interesting because this witness is a witness of a witness. Right? He heard the shots. He looks out. He sees Al 
Othello. Run past him. Followed by a white car. He doesn't see the car as well as Patty Valentine sees the car or as well as Al Bello sees the car. But he knows that the car is white. Right? And he also puts Bello at the scene. Right? In other words, Bello says he was close to the bar. You have a witness who saw Bello being close to the bar. Right now, let's just say, so right now, at this stage of the investigation, either you have an incredible set of coincidences, right? The getaway car just happening to be the same color with the same kind of plates and the same kind of taillights in the same condition, right? As Reuben Hurricane Carter's car. Either that's a unique set of coincidences or there's evidence placing at least Reuben Hurricane Carter's car at the scene of the murders. Now let's talk about what's inside Carter's vehicle. Right? We're going to just cut the fat. Right? We're just talking about that night. I'm not talking about later identifications. I'm not talking about witnesses later changing parts of their story or adding parts of their story. We're just talking about that night. We're talking about multiple sources and descriptions of physical evidence. The car leaving the scene of the crime. The identification of the car shortly after the murders by Patty Valentine. Now let's talk about what's inside Carter's car. Inside Carter's car, police find a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson bullet on the floor near the front seat. Right, so Carter is not only unlucky in that eyewitnesses have described his car to a T. Now he's unlucky on a different level. He just happens to have a bullet shell in his car. Understand, in the trunk is a 12-gauge shotgun shell. Right, so you have two bullet shells in his car. Now understand, here again, how unlucky is Carter? Understand that if the weapons used in the crime were different caliber, right, you have dead people in the bar. If they took out the bullets, and if the bullets are a different caliber, then the bullets in Carter's car wouldn't matter. Right? People would say, well, this is a 32 caliber in Carter's car, and they were hit with 45 caliber bullets over here at the bar. So this 32 caliber just shows that Carter is a gun owner. But that's not what happened understand the bullet shells found in Carter's car match the bullet shells found at the murder scene think about that now let me just say the bullets are found within two hours of the murder. Carter, in fact, is questioned about the 32 caliber bullet. Right? Carter actually admitted that the morning after the crime, keep in mind the crime takes place at 2.30 in the morning, Carter admits that shortly thereafter he was asked about the bullet. Right? So if you believe that there's a police conspiracy, that conspiracy would have necessarily had to have been put together in the first two hours after this crime took place. Let me also point out too that while the 32 caliber bullet was admitted into evidence at Carter's first trial, the shotgun shell in the trunk was not. Right? Because Carter wasn't asked about the shotgun shell. 
right? Just be aware, though, that the police find not only a 32 caliber bullet, they find a shotgun shell. And, of course, a 32 caliber gun and a shotgun were used in the murders. Now, let's talk about Reuben Hurricane Carter's car. You know, it's possible that while Reuben Hurricane Carter was doing other things, he was supposed to be out at, you know, bars and stuff, somebody else could have hopped in his car, could have gone to the murder scene, could have done the murders, and then could have brought the car back, left it on the street, then Carter could have been the innocent person hopping in the car with John Artis and another friend, not knowing what happened. Right? There's even that theory on the case. But a very important witness has already discredited that theory. That witness is Reuben Hurricane Carter himself. Before the grand jury, Reuben Hurricane Carter was steadfast in saying that he had exclusive control of his car that night. Exclusive control of the car. He said nobody else could have used it. What that means is that if Reuben Hurricane Carter's car was at the murder scene, it was at the murder scene under the exclusive control of Reuben Hurricane Carter. Now let's talk about something else Carter told the grand jury. He admitted, now how unlucky could a guy get? He admits to the grand jury that in the hours before the shooting he had an argument with a guy named Neil Morrison. Concerning guns he believed Morrison had taken from his training camp, including a 12-gauge shotgun. Right? This shows that Carter was concerned about the location of the allegedly stolen weapons right before the murder. Right? right before the murder. There's an issue, and it's unresolved, of whether Carter went to an apartment to get the guns. Right? Understand, Carter himself admits that he was talking about guns that had been stolen from him right before the murders took place. Just by chance, on the night that people get shot up by a shotgun, Reuben Carter, right before the murders takes place, is thinking about where his shotgun is. Now let me say this too. Even with all of this evidence, If Reuben Hurricane Carter had an ironclad alibi, then it wouldn't have been him who did the shooting. Right? The police can have all kinds of evidence on you. But if there's film of you someplace else at the time the murders were committed, if you're with people who can vouch for your whereabouts at the time the murders were committed, Right? If I happen to be in a public place where, let's say a bar, where the bartender sees me, people see me, right? Many people can come testify on my behalf. If I order drinks and then I get a receipt and I sign the receipt and the receipt is time stamped and I've been in the bar for two hours and the receipt shows that I left at 2.45, then I'm not the murderer. Here, you don't have that. Here's what you have. You have two police officers, Sergeant Captor and Officer DeCellis, who believe it or not, stop Reuben Hurricane's Carter's car within the vicinity of the murder. Right? Let's say one and a half to two minutes from the murder, they actually stop Hurricane's car ten minutes after the murders. Carter's in his car. He's on the streets. He's in the neighborhood of the crime scene. 
right? They actually stop the car. They actually see Carter. They see artists in the car. Now, here's what's important. Where Carter is stopped, it would have taken him a minute and a half to two minutes to drive away from the murder scene. The cops don't stop him until 10 minutes after the murders. Enough time for Carter to ditch weapons, to stop someplace, to drop off things. Just understand though, where is Reuben Carter within 10 minutes of this murder? He's in his car on the streets close to the murder scene. Right? Understand, if these cops had stumbled into Reuben Carter and he's in a bar, right? Or he's too far away from the murder scene to have committed the murders, he wouldn't be as strong of a witness. Unfortunately for him, his location in the car doesn't exclude him as a suspect. Now let's talk about Carter's alibi that night, right? Let's get by the book and all this other stuff, right? Let's talk about Carter's alibi, the one he presented at the first trial, right? Carter, now keep in mind, the murders take place at 2.30 a.m. We know Carter is about two minutes away from the murder scene at 10.40 a.m. Right? Carter can't dispute where he is 10 minutes after the murder scene because two cops stop him. Right? Two. At his first trial, Carter claimed that he was in a bar called the Night Stop around 2 o'clock in the morning. And that two people, Catherine McGuire and her mother, Anna Mapes, asked him to drive them home. So Carter claimed that that's what he was doing from 2 to 2.30. He was driving these two women home from the bar where he was. Right? Now understand, when questioned, Miss Mates claimed that she recalled it vividly because she had to go to work the next day. Later, we found out that Miss Mapes was actually on vacation and didn't have to go to work the next day. Miss Mapes later admitted that her testimony was false that she was not with Reuben Hurricane Carter. Between 2 and 2.30 a.m. that morning, that he did not drive them home. In other words, the testimony that they offered at trial, that Reuben Hurricane Carter presented at his first trial to establish an alibi was false. So then the question is, well, what role did Reuben Hurricane Carter serve in eliciting this testimony? He played a major role because, believe it or not, there is a letter written by Reuben Hurricane Carter to these alibi witnesses asking them to confirm this story. This story which was false. Right? So, let me just say, when you add it all up, right, in my opinion, a defendant who's offering fake testimony with this set of coincidences linking him to the crime. The same colored car, the same condition of the car, the same butterfly taillights, 
right the same out-of-state license plates with the blue background the car identified by a witness the night of the crime right or the next morning of the crime right a witness who called police and timing wise couldn't possibly have on the spot agreed hey let's frame Reuben Hurricane Carter for this crime when you have independent witnesses right two of whom both say the car speeding away was a white car when you have Reuben Hurricane Carter without an alibi in the area in a car that matches the car's description when you have bullet shells in the car that match the caliber of the bullets used in the crime and when you have Reuben Carter without an alibi I would just make the argument that either you believe Reuben Carter is the unluckiest man in America or you believe Reuben Carter did this crime throw in the fact that Reuben Carter is arguing over the location of his guns including a shotgun right one of the guns used in this crime was a shotgun and to me Reuben Hurricane Carter is guilty of this crime now let me concede that Al Bello later is all over the page right I'll concede that we're just focusing on Al Bello's statements the night of the crime but understand even if you take Al Bello out of this case you have Patty Valentine as a witness right so the point is simply this in my opinion the prosecution doesn't need Al Bella to make their case nor do they need to rely on any cop trying to coach Al Bella right also contrary to folklore right when Carter when the police question one of the people in the bar about whether or not he was shot by Carter he doesn't say no I wasn't shot by Carter right he says I don't know right stuff happened fast understand robbery is not the motive guys came into that bar that night whoever you think they were and they started shooting just imagine yourself having a drink and then shots ring out. Your first priority might not be to turn, look at the assailants, get a description, make a mental note of it, write it down. You might well be more concerned with ducking for cover. Right? Even if a gun's in your face, your focus might not be on the person pointing the gun. It might be on the gun itself right so YouTube allows for social interaction let's have that interaction I know there are many people out there who believe that the Carter case is a travesty that Carter did not do the crime right let's distinguish too between whether there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt and whether Carter did the crime right what I'm arguing here is that Carter did the crime okay whether the prosecution could prove it with witnesses like Al Bello who by his own admission was out trying to commit a robbery that night right okay that's that's another issue but rather than talk about a criminal burden of proof and I understand I've used the word guilty in this video but rather than talk about a criminal burden of proof why don't we make the conversation here more basic did he do it leave your comments in the comment section if there's evidence you feel I'm misrepresenting or if there is dispositive evidence that you feel I've omitted from this video then please leave your comments in the video section let's have a robust discussion 
But my point to you is simply, Reuben Carter, whose versions, by the way, change from book to book, right? Let's just be real here. They change from book to book. Some of the things Carter has said in interviews are demonstratively false. Just to understand, Reuben Carter doesn't have an alibi for the crime. Reuben Carter and his attorney offered false witnesses at their first trial to establish an alibi. Reuben Carter himself says that he had exclusive use of the car that night, right? Witnesses within minutes of the crime in their initial statements to the police described Reuben Hurricane Carter's car to a T, right? And the shells found in Reuben Carter's car within two hours of the murders match the shells at the murder scene. Let me say this about John Artis. Now he was young. There was heavy drinking that night. There is a time gap between the murders and when Carter's car is discovered. It's within 10 minutes, right? But there's a time gap. Understand, there's at least one other person in the car, a bar fly who was too intoxicated to know anything about anything, right? As you read through John Artis's descriptions of that night, note a couple of things. First, there are discrepancies between his recollection and Reuben Hurricane Carter's recollection. Right? There are discrepancies. Number two, in my opinion, and I'm just a third party reading things, it's possible that this young kid who did not know Reuben Carter that long, right? He was a fan of Carter's, but he didn't know Carter. Right? He's hanging with Carter for the first time that night it's possible that he may have blacked out, right? Understand that Al Bello later puts two other black men at the scene of the crime with Carter and one other black man, right? It's unclear whether Carter, excuse me, whether Artis, in my opinion, is passed out in the car or is one of the guys doing the shooting. I believe that night for John Artis is a blur. But understand, Reuben Hurricane Carter, known in the area, right? I don't think I can say the same for him. Right? Let me go one step further. It's his car. The odds of him blacking out and other people doing things and then him being in the car later fully conscious 10 minutes after the crime, I would argue are remote. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Understand too that if I looked at this evidence and if I thought Carter was an innocent man, I'd say so. I don't have some other agenda to try to make innocent people look guilty. What I'm saying here though is we've seen a movie, we've been hit with books, we've been hit with interviews, we've been hit with what I consider to be propaganda. When you look at the facts of the case, the odds of a conspiracy among the witnesses who saw Carter's car leaving the car the, leaving the scene are slim to none, right? Because they're giving statements to the police within minutes of the crime. Minutes of the crime. Keep in mind too, some people in that bar were alive after the shooting. Some people died later, right? So if you're going to do a frame up. That's not the ideal situation for a frame-up, right? The fact that the witnesses' statements sink on the color of the car, the butterfly taillights, the out-of-state plates, the condition of the car, 
says a lot right also the fact that Carter by his own admission is talking about guns right before the crime including just by chance the same kind of gun that's used in the crime and the fact that shells are found in his car that night within two hours right to me makes the chances of a conspiracy spearheaded by a single evil cop as portrayed in the movie or by the local police department it makes that possibility slim to none also if Carter is innocent why is he actively recruiting witnesses to tell false stories on his behalf at trial why is he suborning perjury isn't he already supposed to be out with John Artis and others why would he come up with tall tales and try to present them as fact to the jury let me hear from you leave your comments for me here online visit us at gamblersadvisory.com and from time to time I am going to comment on these big cases as they occur in the Oscar Pistorius case or historical cases such as Reuben Hurricane Carter's. If there are any cases out there that have bothered you, that you'd like to have a second set of eyes look at, I hope you leave those cases here in the comment section to the video as well. Thanks for stopping by.